Thank you to Brilliant for supporting PBS. Paradoxically, the most promising prospects for moving matter around faster than light may be to put a metaphorical brick wall in its way. New efforts in quantum tunneling, both theory and experiment, show that superluminal motion may be possible while still managing to avoid the paradox of superluminal signaling. Quantum tunneling is one of the weirder phenomena in the generally very weird world of quantum mechanics. It describes how quantum particles are able to move across seemingly impenetrable barriers for example, when atomic nuclei decay. But it's not just the Houdini-like power that makes the quantum world weird. It's also that the tunneling motion may move particles faster than they could travel if the barrier wasn't there, and even faster than light could traverse the same distance. We covered quantum tunneling a long, long time ago. In fact, it was the first video we did on quantum mechanics. But things have actually evolved in the five years since. I mean, we've learned a lot on this show, and so can dig deeper into the FTL aspect of quantum tunneling. But there's also new science. And so today, we're going to look at a new theoretical result and a new experiment that are bringing us closer to understanding the superluminal prospects of quantum tunneling. But first, a quick recap of quantum tunneling. Imagine you're driving a car towards a steep hill when the engine cuts out. You can still make it over the hill if you have enough speed, enough kinetic energy to see you to the top. But if the car isn't moving fast enough, then it'll inevitably slow down and roll back. There's nothing in the laws of physics that could allow you to reach the other side of the hill. Well, nothing in the laws of classical physics anyway. A similar thing happens in the world of quantum mechanics, where particles are pushed and pulled by the fundamental forces, forming energetic hills and valleys, a landscape of so-called potential barriers. For example, the protons and neutrons in the atomic nucleus are held in the potential barrier of the strong nuclear force. If one of these particles had enough energy, it could punch through that barrier. Fortunately for the stability of atoms, nucleons mostly remain trapped. Mostly. In radioactive decay, particles that should never have enough energy to escape the nucleus are found to leak out. This is quantum tunneling. The key to the escape is quantum uncertainty. Between observations, quantum particles don't have well-defined properties, and that includes their positions. We represent the location of, say, a proton in a nucleus as a wave function. It's an abstract wave that encodes the information of where the proton might be. Upon measurement, or upon interaction with another particle, the proton could end up anywhere within that wave function, with some locations more likely than others. To understand what happens when a proton bounces around inside a nucleus, we need to see how its wave function evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, which is just the equation of motion of wave functions. This equation tells us that the wave function is mostly reflected or scattered back by the wall of the nucleus. But the Schrodinger equation is very clear that this isn't the only thing that can happen. Due to the blurred out nature of the wave function, a small part of it leaks out to the other side. The proton ends up being simultaneously reflected back and transmitted through the barrier. Now the latter is very improbable, only as likely as the tiny fraction of the wave function that peeks through that barrier. But improbable isn't impossible. And so when you observe the nucleus, it'll collapse into one of these two states, either business as usual or a nuclear decay. We see quantum tunneling everywhere. In radioactive decay, of course, but Tunneling also drives many other important processes. It's necessary for the nuclear fusion reactions that power the sun in some biological processes, and it's even a critical part of the workings of transistors and other electronic components. But even with the ubiquity of this phenomenon, we know very little about what happens during the tunneling event itself. For example, is the transition of the particle from one side of the barrier to the other instantaneous, or does it take some time? It turns out that it's very hard to determine the so-called tunneling time, because in the fuzzy world of quantum mechanics, it's hard to even define what we mean by tunneling time, or of time for that matter. One thing, however, is clear. For a number of definitions of tunneling time, faster than light movement really does seem to be a thing. This was first shown by the physicist Thomas Hartman in 1962, who found that for one definition, 
the time taken to tunnel can become independent of the thickness of the barrier. In other words, you can double the length of your barrier and your particle will take the same amount of time to travel all the way through. For a thick enough barrier, this Hartman effect can effectively teleport real physical matter between locations faster than it would take to travel the distance sans barrier, even at the speed of light. Now, Professor Einstein is not a fan of faster than light motion. As we've said before, his special theory of relativity explains that if you move faster than light, you can send signals into the past and create a whole bunch of paradoxes. So in our previous tunneling episode, we offered an explanation for why this effect doesn't break relativity. It came down to the definition of tunneling time. If the position of the tunneling particle isn't perfectly known, how do we know when to start and stop our tunneling stopwatch? It seems natural to define those times as whenever the center of the wave function passes the start and end points. But what if the wave function changes during the tunneling? In a sense, the leading edge of the old wave function becomes the center of the new wave function. It's like if you measured a train's travel time through a tunnel by clicking a stopwatch as the center of the train passed through the entrance to the tunnel, and then again when the front of the train reaches the exit. You'll get a shorter time than if you clicked for the same point at both tunnel ends. Now, if this was a quantum tunneling train, then only the front carriage would make it through the tunnel, while the rest of the train would be reversed and travel back the way it came. And then when you observe the train, all but one of the carriages would vanish. So it's hard to measure the travel time of a quantum train or a quantum wave function because it's hard to define the start and end points. Certain definitions seem to imply faster than light motion, but that's also true of motion without a barrier. Launch a particle through empty space with a well-defined starting position and its position wave function will spread out before the finish line. The center of that wave function can't travel faster than the speed of light, but upon measurement, the particle may appear to be at the leading edge of the wave function potentially nudging it above light speed. So you can see how the question of tunneling time is a bit messy. If we want to answer this, we need to define a better question. Let's instead ask the following. Is it possible to send a message between two points that are separated by a barrier faster than you can transmit the same message through empty space? Fortunately, a recent paper helps us answer exactly that from a theoretical standpoint. Most previous work on tunneling time relied on the Schrodinger equation, which doesn't incorporate Einstein's special theory of relativity and so has no speed limit baked into it. These new guys use the Dirac equation, which properly incorporates special relativity and so we can take any emerging FTL motion more seriously. The explanation boils down to a thought experiment. Imagine you try to send a message encoded in a collection of particles to a friend, and you want it to arrive as soon as possible. Should you send the message through empty space or through a barrier? Can quantum tunneling really speed up the transmission of the information contained in that message? Well, it turns out that the answer depends on what you mean by receive the message. If you can count the message received at the instant that the first particle arrives, then the new study finds that the tunneling message really does arrive first. And the thicker the barrier, the bigger the difference in arrival time. That's just what Hartman calculated using arguably the wrong equation back in 1962. The study also finds that the tunneling wave packet isn't necessarily reshaped all that much. It's not clear that we can really think of the new wave function as just the cutoff front end of the old wave function, or the first carriage of the quantum train. So, FTL verified, right? Well, not quite. The study finds that the average traveling time for tunneling particles is shorter than the average time for free-flying particles. But that's only for the tunneling particles that make it through. Most get reflected by the barrier, and as the barrier gets thicker, exponentially more get reflected until only a minuscule number pass through. If you try to send your message over and over, your friend will most likely receive a free-flying particle long before they receive a tunneling particle. Staggeringly more likely, for any meaningful distance. And that's just because the former is much more likely to make it. Does this really save causality? In order to violate causality, your friend 
would need to send a return message that was influenced by your message to them, which could then cause a paradox loop. The authors say that more work is needed to verify that this is ruled out, but in general, this looks like a lifeline for causality. All this theoretical stuff is good and fun, but what does experiment have to say? Efforts from the early 80s and on seem to agree that the Hartman effect is real, but interpretation of the results suffer from some of the same problems as the theoretical calculations. How do we define tunneling time? And even trickier, how do we define a tunneling time that we can actually measure? For a real physical experiment, we need a clock that's physically measurable. In 2020, a paper was published in the journal Nature that used the swiveling axis of a particle's quantum spin as the clock hand. The phenomenon is called Lamour precession, in which the particle's dipole magnetic field, which is defined by its spin axis, processes like a top in an external magnetic field. The rate of rotation can be used as an internal clock. In this experiment, they fired ultra-cold rubidium atoms at a laser field that was spread out over a small area. That field was strong enough to deflect the atoms completely and so provided an insurmountable barrier. However, some particles did manage to tunnel through. For those ones, their spins were altered by the magnetic field of the laser, and the longer they spent inside the barrier, the more their spins changed. So, okay, what did they find? Did the particles travel faster than light? Well, no, but they weren't trying to make them do that. They were just trying to verify whether using spins as an internal clock would work at all, and they were successful. The spins were altered by pretty much the same amount that the theory predicted that they would be. But the results are still relevant for the faster than light Hartman effect because the spin-based clocks that they were working with should still show this effect under FTL circumstances with faster particles and a thicker barrier. The point is that the theory and the experimental tools are now converging on a way to answer our questions once and for all. Is faster than light motion or influence possible? Perhaps yes, but it seems that it's only in cases where faster than light signaling is impossible. Because as we've discussed many times before, when it comes to the speed of light, the house always wins. All signals in our universe, whether via quantum tunneling or quantum entanglement, seem to be bound by the same limits imposed by relativity. The universe insists that we take the long way around. And as fast as we can find them, it seals up any new shortcuts through space-time. Thank you to Brilliant for supporting PBS. To understand astrophysics, Brilliant believes that it helps to have a solid understanding of relativity. Brilliant has a lesson on special relativity that includes interactive challenges and problems to solve. A hands-on approach can guide you through thinking strategies for challenging subjects like relativity. It starts out explaining relativity in terms of boats passing each other on a river, then goes into some puzzles that require challenging perspective, like the ball stack bounce, and then goes into the speed of light and even time travel. To learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash spacetime. As always, if you've joined us on Patreon, I can't emphasize enough how helpful your support is in keeping this show going. But today, I want to give a huge shout out to our Big Bang supporter, Henry Van Stin. Henry, as a scientist, I may not know everything about the depths of quantum tunneling, but as a New Yorker, I know that every tunnel needs a name. So I'm proud to announce the Henry Van Stin Quantum Tunnel. It connects downtown Manhattan to, well, wherever you live right now, so that we can hang out. It goes through solid bedrock, so there's a low probability that your quantum wave function will make it through. But if you do, then the trip is instantaneous and so you get to avoid the downtown traffic. Henry, you have our thanks, and now you have our tunnel. Please visit soon. In the last episode, we talked about why many physicists believe that magnetic monopoles should really exist. You guys had your own strong opinions and lots of questions. McRolnicek asks about the hedgehog configurations, the radiating knots in the Higgs field that might lead to magnetic monopoles. They ask, if these things can't be removed by smooth variation in the vectors, then how come they're created at high energy events? Well, the answer is that at very high energies, the direction of the Higgs field becomes free to vary wildly and adjacent points in the field are less coupled to each other. 
Only when the field cools down do adjacent points become more tied to each other. Any discontinuities that form at high temperatures can then be frozen into the field. And Nate Underwood asks if the Higgs field can form so that there are no monopoles, no discontinuities. Well, the answer is yes, but it's extremely unlikely for the same reason that it's increasingly unlikely for a crystal to have no flaws the larger it is. Try to make a flawless crystal the size of the universe. Eric says that if magnetic monopoles are massive enough to collapse the early universe, wouldn't we only find them inside black holes? Well, it depends on their density and whether inflation threw them apart faster than they could find each other. It's certainly possible that magnetic monopoles could end up inside black holes, in fact, some recent work suggests that an individual magnetic monopole would manifest as a black hole in that it would have an event horizon. However a monopole managed to get into a black hole, one thing is clear, it would still behave like a monopole in that the black hole would radiate magnetic field lines. Same as if the black hole held electric charge, you would produce an electric field. And presumably, if black holes had enormous magnetic charges, we'd see that in the way that they interact with matter. As it is, the magnetic fields we observe around black holes seem more consistent with regular dipole fields with both north and south poles, for example in the way that they channel jets of material in opposite directions. Wasco92 asks the real question. Magnetic monopoles aside, why did Moody arrange for the whole goblet of fire thing when he could have easily taken some of Harry's blood on one of the numerous occasions that they met? Okay, Wasco92, I know this was supposed to be some hilarious non sequitur with no relation to the episode, but the joke is on you, my friend, because it's relevant to this episode. As everyone knows, Moody tricked Harry into touching the Triwizard Cup, which was actually enchanted into a portkey that transported him and poor Cedric off Hogwarts campus. It's been hypothesized that portkeys are based on wormhole technology, but actually, they may well use quantum tunneling. And that process actually evades Hogwarts security wards because wizards are rubbish at quantum mechanics. I hope that clears things up for you. 